All right, cool. Thank you. Um, Uti Petik, Shakir, Lenubin, Huyukek, welcome. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Aron Montenegro, and I'll be um, introducing uh, this gathering today. I just want to thank everyone for, for being here, and uh, hopefully, we can have a fruitful conversation and uh, more can come out of this. So, um, the UCs usually do this. Um, land acknowledgement but a lot of times very performative so i just want to switch that up and just say land back and reparations now um and then you know with this conversation hopefully we can kind of project that and see um what what that means what that can look like um so i, I went ahead and started a little uh presentation to kind of uh set the the groundwork for this and for the structure of this afternoon, uh, we're going to have two blocks of speakers, um, and they'll be introducing themselves um, in a bit. So, and I'll just pass the pass the mic on to them. And uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get right on into this. And I'll share my screen and get this started. All right, cool. Again, um, just to emphasize, um, we're on stolen land, wherever you may be, unless you're in your native homeland, uh, that's built off stolen labor and the stolen lives of so many people. So I just want to give um, honor and recognition um, to the original caretakers of the land and those who've been dispossessed um, in this process, colonial process. Uh, again, this intention for today is to uh, provide a critical framework looking at academia as a whole as a settler institution um, and seeing our our positions uh, within these spaces and what we can do so just to open up this is a you know for the boycott divest and sanction movement um, in solidarity with uh, palestine and the apartheid regime um, repressing folks um, over there and seeing how uh, companies and institutions are complicit uh, within this process um so then this is not just uh, the ucs university of california's we're not restricting the conversation to just that you know the cal state uh in, you know uh universities and institutions across this land um again how they're formulated and how they're constructed and how they uh, sustain, th sustain themselves um as a white supremacist sexist uh, institution um based on exploitation so i'm gonna go real quick through this just to give highlight a mention of different struggles um, throughout the land. Um, the UCs are invested in a 30 meter tower in uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, um, sacred lands, again, just for this um, colonial imperialist project. Uh, folks are out there um, resisting and seeing what we can do as students within the UCs to divest from this project. Again, it's not limited to just the UCs um, right here in, um, Southern California, Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach, uh, sits on sacred land uh, called Purugna, um, shared land of the Tongva, Chumash, and Hashimian people. Um, and it's currently uh, has had this plan to create a, a shopping mall um, within the vicinity and have recently dumped um, dirt all over the sacred land. So folks out there uh, resisting and, and supporting any way we can. Again, not limited to California as an institution, the UCs and Cal States, University of Utah, uh, this colonizer by the name of Richard Hansen um, is leading this, this project um, in Guatemala, Ishimuleu, and um, looking to privatize a, a sacred site for us, um, El Mirador um, in El Petén, um, in the land known as Guatemala. So this guy, again, is just trying to privatize He's an anthropologist and he, he's just uh, continuing with this colonial project in other people's homeland. Um, Coca-Cola is another uh, company, dirty company, the UCs and many other universities are invested in, have contracts with, and they um, have th had this, these campaigns of, of killing union uh, organizers in Colombia, not limited there own swaths of land um, across uh, the region of Central and South America 
and just uh, again repress uh, the people. And uh, these institutions have contracts with companies like Coca-Cola. Um, so looking to more to divest from these kind of companies. Um, Julia Packard uh, is involved with uh, the Israeli military, as you can see the information uh, there. Um, they also donate to uh, the Cal States. Um, yeah, so just to read real quick, um, HP provides uh, imaging for apartheid Israel's checkpoints and ID card systems. Again, this is to be in solidarity um, with Palestinian people and support the boycott, divest, and sanction movement and not limited to just that. Um, so again, these are different companies that have been um, involved um, in apartheid, in militarization, in displacement um, and, and violent repression. The UCs usually um, have job fairs and at these job fairs, they invite uh, companies like Raytheon and Northrop Grumman who are war profiteers um, again, you can see here one instance in UC Santa Barbara, another one at UCLA um, as recent as last year. So we have these on the institutional level, uh, the, uh, these universities invested in collaborating with these more war machine companies, but also on an interpersonal level. So we have this guy, uh, Michael Mises, I don't know his last name, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, white supremacists went out to the Unite the Right um, um, rally in Virginia and went out with the intention to fight. You see he has his, his, um, his boxing gear on. Um, you see these are white supremacist symbols. He was a grad student at UCLA engineering department and had a security clearance with Northrop Grumman. Uh, I think uh, there were some charges filed against him. I think he was expelled from his, his job. Um, but it's unsure if he's still a student at UCLA. This is another guy, uh, Nathan uh, D'Amigo, who um, part of this uh, white supremacist group, Identity Europa, and uh, is uh, also a student, was a student, may still be at Cal State uh, um, near, near Sacramento. And yeah, he's just another uh, face that is, again, not just on an institutional level, but on a personal level. These are the people who are on your, your campuses who have these organizations. It's not just limited to this these couple of folks, um, but there are a number of, of organizations that try to legitimize themselves on student campuses. And not just organizations, but academics themselves. Uh, the UCs can try to do what they want to undo their racist past, um, like change the name um, of a hall but, and they can also um, try to change policy, right? To, for reparations for native people, right? But, you know, do they really hold up to their word? You know, they're at the moment, you know, the UC said they, they would give back uh, cultural artifacts of native people and only has done so at 20%, you know, um, and these, again, these, these institutions are based on the stolen land, stolen labor, stolen lives um, of so many. Uh, so you have on institutional level and again on personnel. Uh, this guy is a professor at UCLA um, and uh, he's an anthropologist, a white anthropologist. Um, I think that should say enough right there, um, but he uh, profit off, you know, uh, sacred stories of the Pueblo of uh, Oklahoma people um, and people have, you know, called them out and he's still uh, teaching, you know, so a lot of his motivation is to uh, address these issues and to tell our stories on our own terms um, from a critical perspective. So this is what we're facing when we go into these spaces. And again, the goal of this conversation is to, to address that, but also build a supportive community of critically minded folks uh, within these institutions and how we can support each other. Again, this is another case, UC Berkeley, uh, another racist professor, um, just trying to, to justify his racism. Uh, was called out um, and is just saying what the, he was blaming victims of oppression for their own oppression. So it's good to see, you know, folks um, address this directly and disrupt uh, the, these racist professors. Again, another case, I don't want to go into it. There's so many cases. Um, so this is just another one at, at Cal State East Bay. 
and it's not just limited to racial uh, implication, racial violence, but also uh, sexual violence um, by professors. Again, there's so many cases. This one's at UC San Diego, another one at UCLA. Um, you know, so these are again issues that are ingrained within these systems. Uh, but we have a different light. You know, we have folks on the ground um, at UCLA, um, Anaya Roy, uh, Teresa Gay Johnson, uh, Lacey Abrego, our folks, you know, this the Institute of Inequality and Democracy, um, which actually supported in this event. So thank you. So shout out. Um, we got folks of uh, underground scholars, you know, formerly incarcerated students, um, also um, within these spaces on the ground doing what we can do. Um, Cali Lido Hernandez um, is another per person that's doing the work. Um, so we just want to kind of end this you know, introduction um, by highlighting this. We know, again, that what we're facing with this white supremacy, um, and these institutions of power, right? But we find ourselves some of within these spaces, you know. So, so what can we do uh, as as a community um, and and challenge these institutions? So, um, and lastly, to end off right here, just want to highlight uh, Mamia Abu Jamal, a political prisoner um, who is also a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, um, and and you know, an event was just uh, organized just the other day. Uh, there are fears of him being contracted with COVID. Um, but again, we, we do all this, you know, to, to free Mamiya and free all, all political prisoners, prisoners of war and uh, stay grounded, right? And not let these institutions uh, get to us. So um, with that, that's me on my end. Um, for the rest of this uh, afternoon, I'll be taking questions. Feel free to direct it to me. You see my Q&A um, name right there. Um, and then, so we're gonna go ahead and move ahead with the um, with the program for today, and and get things started. So, um, yeah. So we'll begin first with uh, Diana, Nalia, and Ella. Y'all here? Y'all present? Y'all can introduce yourselves. The space is yours. Whatever y'all want. Um, we'll say we'll save questions for the end. And again, thank you everyone um, for 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 coming, being present. Um, and then, yeah, so thank you, everyone. Hey, y'all. Well, thank you for having us here. Um, we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. Naya, do you want to start us off? Sure. All right. Um, I can start us. Um, so my name is Nalia. I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine in sociology. Um, I'm in my fourth year. I'm also Maya Chorti descent. Um, my family is from the border areas between El Salvador and Honduras. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Diana Gamez. I officially, I'm a second year PhD student um, at UCI in the Department of Anthropology, but that is my second program. So technically this is like my fourth year in graduate school. Um, I have roots in Guatemala, I'm born and raised in LA in MacArthur Park. Um, and I'm just really, you know, excited to share space with Naya and Ella here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ella Turan. Hello, everyone. So good to see y'all. And thank you again, Aaron, for inviting us. Um, and creating space for us to have these conversations. Um, I'm also a second year uh, in the visual studies PhD program at UCI, originally from New York. I've been uh, an Angelino now for a decade and um, I'm an artist and also uh, abolitionist, activist, artivist, slash, 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 all the dashes. Um, so we're hoping to bring you some creativity today. Um, my, my people hail from Haiti, so um, very connected and feel very rooted in revolution and revolutionary practices. And hopefully we can um, crowdsource some of those things today. That's what we're looking to do to build community. Um, I think it's just dope that we can all, even though you know we're in a pandemic and things are uh, odd to say the least, um, we can use this as an opportunity to build and to be together at the same time. So 
What we're going to do first is um, we really would love to hear from y'all, actually. We don't want to be doing all the talking. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our experience at the end, but first we want to kind of see where y'all are at. Um, you know, we're, for, for some of you, you might be in the middle of the spring semester. If you're on the quarter system, you're almost end, at the end of the winter session. And, you know, all, we have to attend to all of these things while at the same time being in the environment that Aaron has laid out for us, right? Being present and, uh, and knowing and understanding that all these forces are also working at us, working on us. So we want to take the time to figure out like how as a how as a community we can support each other and what we need um, and use that as a launching point to to move forward. So what I'm going to do right now is um, in the chat, I'm going to put a link to a Jamboard. And if you're not familiar with them, it's think of it as a collective brainstorming board. Um, so you can go in and you'll see that the first board asks a question, what do you need to thrive? Because in these grad school streets, we're not just trying to survive, right? We're trying to thrive. If, if we just survive, they've gotten the best of us and we're not gonna let that happen. So we want to think about what do we actually need to thrive. So on that board, um, you can post a sticky note with your thoughts. You can put in an image if you're more of a visual person, you can put in some text. Um, and then as you start seeing things pop up, if you wanna draw lines and connections to things, you wanna affirm stuff that's on the board, um, please go ahead and do that. So we're gonna give you a few minutes to just put some things on the board and then um, we'll move on to the next question. And as we do that, we will also um, have a little bit of music so that you can um, be in good spirit as you're um, populating the board. So we're gonna start. Please add whatever um, spirit is telling you to add to the board and then we'll move on to the next question. Sorry. I think the link needs um the access. Oh, okay, my bad. It says that anybody with the link can view it. So let's try. I just did it again. Let's try again. Anybody with the link should be able to view it. And I see a bunch of people on there already. I just, I think that we can't um, actually add things to it unless we have edit access. Oh, at edit access, my bad. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, you're right, you're right. Okay, done. Okay, everybody should have the ability to edit now. Thank you.
historia no se rompe. Que vida mi gente y sus sueños mi lucha. Que nunca tu nombre está aquí. Sigo aquí, sigo aquí, sigo aquí. La revolución es la revolución. La justicia se encontrará en la unión de las culturas opuestas a los gobiernos que nos cobran duro por vivir. Political structures, rupture under the weight of the people that suffer. I've seen it online, waiting for it to bust. They say we give everybody a couple of more minutes. Crowds of water eating like carnivores, treating the poor like we your kind of whores. That's why I'm pimping the system. Yeah, y'all dealing with tech knowledge. I got my education when I skip college. They say it's simple as economics, but I could clutch a fist full of dollars and still catch hell from a racist cop. I make a sacrifice, essential to feeding the people as a bag of rice. Charlie Paradise, living this rapper's life. My appetite for destruction is never satisfied. When they advertise some bullshit, the people believe in a pack of lies. It makes me want to black and smile. Embrace the lazy laws. Sit back, get my vape on, play my favorite song. The music ain't to make us calm. That's why we play the whole. All right, so we can start looking at some of these. Um, there are some common themes coming up of community, stable housing, money. And Diana and, and, and Nalia, please chime in with connections that you see too. I'm like good food. <laughs> right? <laughs> and my family food. They <laughs> emphasize that. Not just any food. <laughs> Green spaces to be in, I love that. Yes, we need to get the environment in there too. I see somebody making connections between access to physical and mental health. Someone said, active continuous acknowledgement of history and harm and knowing I can be heard without having to back up my experiences or someone else experiences with data. Yes, snaps to that. So many times we tell our stories and then it's followed by defensiveness. Like everybody feels like they have to prove like we're doing things, we're helping you, we're, we're doing X, Y, and Z. And it's like, nah, we just want you to listen and hear it and acknowledge that it, it exists. So I definitely feel that. Yep, and also just to add a little bit more to that and the reason why it stands out to me is because that's part of the reason why we approached the, this space in this way, the three of us, you know, felt like there isn't a name, there isn't a need to name all this fucked up shit that we experience sometimes, right? Like a lot of us know this already. I don't already contextualize it, right? So now we can, you know, know that and not have to spend time on like me telling you the fucked up shit that I deal with on the daily. Mm -hmm. I have to say, and there's something also um, <clears throat> affirming about knowing that other folks are going through similar experiences, just so we can see like, we're in community in this messed up space, but we're about to be in community in the thriving space because um, that's what we're gonna attend to next. So folks can keep adding to this. Um, we're gonna move to the next board. So I'm just gonna scroll over one. And our next prompt is gonna be, now that we've seen all the things, all the needs that we have, how can we, so how can we create community? How can we as a community support this thriving culture? Now that we see what we need, how can community support this thriving culture? And that could be this community, that could be community on our campuses, in our departments, um, faculty who may or may not be on our departments because it's not always you know, the people that we're the closest to that are going to be the ones to giving us giving us the support. So, but what do we need to, to create that thriving space to get the stuff we need on the other board? So we're gonna give you a few minutes to also put that in.
So what's what's speaking to you, Diana and Nalia? Uh, well, one of the things that immediately sticks <laughs> out to me is like mutual aid and sharing resources, skill support. Um, so I have like really bad anxiety. And for me, like I didn't realize how much support I needed, like in the school setting. Um, until I started talking to other people about disability access within classroom settings um, and seeing how other graduate students were navigating getting more time to do assignments, right? Um, trying to address like my actual needs in order to be at the same level that everyone else is at. And that also means like helping, like getting asking and then also giving help to other people like for writing emails because sometimes like you really don't know how to write an email and like, you know, like you have to do it. And sometimes it's just like, damn, like this email has been sitting in my email box for like a month and I need to respond or else I'm not going to get paid. But also I don't know what to say because I want to fucking talk shit. Like where the fuck is my money? <laughs> you know, uh, those are like two things that really stick out to me. <laughs> yeah. And I love that. Cause that's so important because sometimes we don't re we don't even realize that we can ask for stuff that seems like up in the sky that other people who are privileged take for granted every single day. Like they've just been growing up with that, the ability to ask and get. And because sometimes we are placed in situations growing up where we live in scarcity, we don't realize that we could just ask and get stuff too. And there's a lot of resources. And that's something that is a thread throughout here. Um, getting resources, sharing resources, having resources available like childcare, like basic, basic shit that you could just have so that you can focus on other things, right? Um, and I would say like, that's the difference between like a student who is privileged and a student who is trying to make it through is that um, those resources are there, but the privileged student doesn't have to worry about anything else but being a student, <laughs> you know? And we have to worry about like people dying in our communities, racism, sexism, <laughs> you know, gender phobia. Like we have to worry about all these things on top of having to be a student. Um, so it's good to know that you know, there are resources to, to help alleviate some of those things. And then I think being around folks helps with some of the other things. What about you, Diana? One of the, well, a couple stood out to me, but one of the ones that I think might like grab at what I'm trying to like really point out is that it says denial of capitalistic values, like the competition and especially in grad programs, right? Like, I don't know what it is with certain folks and like specifically the university and like the way that it exists, you know, that there's like a big individualistic, capitalistic, 
you know, enforcement within knowledge production. And one of the things that I think I have to be very clear with myself is that my personal and political commitments are antithetical to the university. So I'm completely committed to always sharing knowledge, to always supporting folks in ways that I can, right? So I think even for me as a graduate student, like at some point it gets super dark where there's this like big competitive way of, you know, the way that a lot of these programs are formatted, um, which is even antithetical to how knowledge production is made, right? Like I don't come with the knowledge into these spaces just on my own but like from the women in my family, right? Like those are the people who are at the core of informing my work. So having to find spaces outside of the university in order to, for that to hold me down because the reality is that, you know, some folks are hella competitive yep. and will throw you under the bus when they're able to, you know? Listen, that's the culture, right? It's like, you know, do or die. So it is, there is a culture of that and it's not necessarily true that they tell you when you come in that you don't have to subscribe to that. <laughs> so, so I think it's amazing, Diana, that you are, you are like steadfast and you're able to be firm in your values. Like that's part of what it is, right? Like knowing what you value, knowing what you, what your line is in the sand, um, that's what's going to help you continue to like be your, not lose yourself in these, in these programs. Um, because they don't tell you that you don't have to do these things. They don't, they, there is a common way, but that doesn't mean it's the only way, right? It doesn't mean that you have to do your dissertation a certain way. Like if you, you can't go outside of those boundaries, there's always a way to do it because people are the ones who make up policies. And so a policy may be there, but it can be changed. It can, there are exceptions that can be made there. It happens all the time. So we have to know that um, if we don't, if we don't know our own boundaries and if we don't ask those questions, then it's it's very possible to just get like sucked into it all. What about you, Ella? Is there anything that specifically stood out to you? Well, I really also appreciate the piece about sharing resources and this is going piggybacking off of you because I feel like I've at least, you know, looking at my own cohort, we share resources all the time. We don't, we kind of like came in with this mindset that we're gonna all figure it out together. And that has made a world of difference being in classes and trying to like navigate through writing things or being a TA or getting funding. Like when things happen, we're like immediately texting each other like, what the fuck just happened? What was that? Did you get this? Did you get that? Whereas I think, you know, there is, there is sometimes a spirit of, no, I'm just going to take care of myself before I take care of anybody else. Um, so that really spoke to me, I think, because I've experienced that. And I, I think it has made a difference for me to be able to know that I have folks that are, that have my back and I have their back also because of that. Um, and I think also like being like disrupting and demanding, like understanding what we can ask for like stepping in one person once told me um for some for some of that y'all may not know that um I was on the other side of of this line as an administrator for a really long time so I have like an administrator mind sometimes and somebody once told me like if you want to make changes at these places you have to step into the mind of senior leaders you have to understand what keeps them at night to get to what you want. So you have to think about how to speak their language so that you can dismantle the language. Um, and it was very, it was very interesting because then you get, you start to understand like how the system works and these capitalist structures, why they take so long to be broken down. But then you also start to understand where the cracks are within them so that you can, you know, make some inroads, infiltrate and be able to really, you know, use the system to get to make the changes that we want to make. So it's it's a real, I think it's really interesting because um, one of the reasons why I stopped being an administrator was because I felt like you were talking, Diana, about this, about like holding on to your values. I felt like I was constantly being challenged with that. And I just didn't want to do it anymore, <laughs> you know? So sometimes you have to make those hard choices too, but um, 
it was also it was also easier because I had people around. I had community to to say like this is a good decision and we support you doing doing this and not having to sacrifice your own um, standards um, to do the kind of work that you want to do. Yeah, kind of like just building off of that. So for me, it was like like learning the language, right? And like mindset and recognizing that like, I don't want to engage in that. And when I realized like, I don't care if I get, so like in grad school, um, if you get a B, that's kind of like considered failing. Um, and so like, when I realized that I don't want to engage in that same academic language, I started getting B's and I started not caring about it because I knew like I was learning, like if I'm going to write, I'm going to learn how to write and practice the writing style that I want to write in. Right. Because that's what the purpose is of grad right. school. It's like learning your craft, right? And so like practicing my craft, regardless of what the grades I was getting was more important to me than getting a good grade and like being considered a passing student. Um, now, like as I've progressed in my program, right? Like I'm a fourth year in a six year program. Um, as I've progressed in my program, it's become easier to like say no because I know my shit better, right? <laughs> and like, that's like the coolest thing to see is like that you like can talk shit better and like find those like loopholes and like, like one of the things I specialize in is like um, is methods because I love talking shit about how poorly people conduct research because most people conduct like terrible research for like very, very, like very different things. Um, and like, especially in the academy, one of the easiest things to like fuck up on is like not being ethical, right? Um, and then like not even considering people's own agency yeah. uh, in like creating the research um, that they're being researched on. Yeah. Yeah. We, I was talking about this uh, bef a while ago with, with folks about methods that methods is only as good as the lenses in which you bring to them, right? Because if the lens is racist, your data is going to be racist, your whole study is going to be racist, like all of that, right? So if you're just using tools and methods without these lenses that you're, you know, and without the attention, um, your, your study is going to be shit, basically. And that happens all the time, like we see that. Um, and I also want to just really quickly point to Ritz, who put in the chat, um, learning my craft, and this is what you talked about, Nalia, too, because the craft is important, right? And you know you're learning. So I love that you were like, you're gonna be, your priority is to attend to your own learning and to learn your craft. Because once you learn the craft and you've mastered it, you can blow it up. You can make your own method. You can write the way you wanna write. And no one's gonna be able to tell you anything because you already know, you're already the expert. Right. And so I also think it's important down the road when we think about what we will be creating in the world after we get these letters behind our names, that it can be on our terms. Like nobody at that point is going to policing what you write and how you write it and what you're saying. Yeah, if I could build off of, of both of you, um, honestly, the reason why I left my first PhD program, it's because of its implications that it was trying to enforce upon me, you know, for the type of craft that I would have, right? So I think it's important for us to be super aware of the context of the program that you're participating in. The type of analysis and like really understanding what university are you in, what program are you in, what kind of classes are you taking, you know, because this has a lot of implications for the type of craft that you end up having. And at, at some point too, you know, those of us who are refusing the type of craft that they're trying, you know, to impose upon us have to deal with some tensions. And, you know, at least in my case, I was like, the craft that I'm trying to build is not here, so I'm just gonna bounce. Yeah, yeah it's not good for you. <laughs> you know? 
because there are, you know, like there are folks who are, you know, really allowing you to bring the craft how you're going to bring it. And at least for me, the folks who have pushed that for me have been black folks. Like black folks have always been at the center of pushing and making space for allowing me to create the craft that I want to create. Agreed. And I think that's part of it too, to surround yourself with the people who are going to let you do what is going to bring you joy because this is not an easy journey so the people who are going to who are going to allow you to do those things are also the people who are going to make sure that you're learning in a rigorous way like they're holding your feet to the fire so it's not like you're skating or anything but they also want you to succeed in what you want to succeed in and yeah like all the people at uci many of the people at UCI who, who I've found, who I've been able to surround myself are black women. And they've been my champions and I've been able to go to them and be really candid with them and they've supported what I wanna do. That may look different from you know institution to institution, but I think it's critical because faculty, allies and supporters, mentors are so key to being able to really thrive in these spaces and there are some just phenomenal people around to help do that. Yeah, and sometimes it's not like a lot of people, right? Like in my own case, like I have like one person that's like, just do whatever you want. I'll <laughs> check in like at the end of the year, um, run free, which is like good and it's bad, right? Like it's good because I can do what I want and I'm not gonna get in trouble for it but it's bad because I don't know what grad school is supposed to be. And especially on Zoom, like I don't know all the forms that you have to do to like advance to the next stage, right? Like I don't know like how much you're supposed to pay at every stage because you gotta pay to advance to the next stage, right? Um, Like all of these things, I'm like, I don't know from like my faculty advisor or like other faculty, like I know it because like the people that I'm in community with, right? Like are varied stages and like can just like share that knowledge, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I was just checking in with Aron about time. I think we may be close to our time. Um, So I just wanted to see if we had any like final thoughts or if, if folks um, in the audience had other questions they wanted to um, chime in with or other things that you just wanna add on to the conversation based on some of the things that we've said um, so that we can uh, sort of like close it out and pass it on to the next set of folks. So uh, Lord, Lauren said, I appreciate this. I never thought of my education as a craft. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, if you think about it, going into grad school, like there's a certain way that you have to navigate all the material. You know, I, there is a certain way. <laughs> one, of, one of my professors, I think this was like the, one, some of the best advice that I received is like, learn how to read. Like you have to shift how you understand reading comprehension in grad school, how you understand critique in grad school. Like this is an art, it's a craft to be able to do this and to write in the way that we write to to form ideas about what we're reading and to challenge and to affirm things that we're reading. So yeah, absolutely it's a craft because you know it takes and it takes uh, some time to get to get it down. It's not like you can you can't, you know, you can just like pick it up one day and then just be like, oh yeah, I got it. I feel like it takes practice. It's like a continuous, it's like a muscle, you know, you got to work it out. Very true, Jasmine. That's a great point that it is a business. Yep. So cool. I think for the sake of time, we can just transition to the other folks and then we'll we'll get more of these questions and comments later towards the end and be in dialogue with each other. So um, I'll let you all introduce you. Thank you, uh, Diana, Nadia, and Ella. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. Uh, look forward to 
uh, continue building with you all. And I think we all have like this extended community uh, amongst ourselves. So cool, without no further ado, I'd like to transition to uh, the other set of folks. Again, like they can introduce themselves. Um, so go right on ahead. Hi everyone, um, my name is Brie Bird. I'm a second year in feminist studies at UCSC. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. I use she and they pronouns and I'm from Durham, North Carolina. So I'm a little Southern queer transplant trying to figure out what to do here. Um, but it seems that a lot of North Carolinians somehow end up in the UC. So mm -hmm. I'm really interested in those sort of connections, but really excited to talk to you all and sort of like share the work that we were able to do in the last year or two years um, that really kind of also really ties in really well with how y'all frame this. So really excited. Hey everyone, my name is uh, Carlos Cruz. Uh, I wanna start out by giving a shout out to Aaron, to Nalia, to Diana. Um, that was, that was you know, Ella, that was a dope ass presentation, great setup. Um, thank you all for that. Um, thank you all for, for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. You know, you, you know, you could be doing, you know, a million other things on, on Zoom, but here we are in this Zoom room, so appreciate you all. Um, I am a third year history PhD student at UC so-called Santa Cruz. Um, I am on academic probation. I am on um, conduct probation. So essentially I'm getting, you know, axed out from the university um, from, from different angles. So I'm here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about what, what led me to be in this position. And yeah, here, here's Brenda and Jasmine. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for this space. Uh, I'm already feeling like just some healing and some much needed um, solidarity, you know, in the struggle. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student, um, but since we're talking about decolonizing and shit, I honestly hate the whole like fourth year, first year, like don't fucking rank me. <laughs> I'm making it through, right? Um, but I, I, I do archeology span and I'm an anthropology. So a lot of what was said in the, in the first part of this really resonates with me because oh, it is a struggle if you are a person of color in that discipline um, and if you're trying to challenge these things, right? So um, I'm also a single parent. That's been extremely difficult in grad school. It is not compatible. And um, because of being able to be in community with, with people like y'all, I'm re kind of focusing my research into uh, how to show that archeology span perpetuates settler colonialism and um, should probably be abolished. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's 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 where I'm coming from. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm a second year, also at Santa Cruz, and I'm in um, the visual studies program. But I don't like to talk to tell people that. I'm only telling you all in case anyone has questions about visual studies things in art history or things like that in particular. I am a, uh, from the East Coast, I'm from Maryland. I have lived in California for almost five years, which is kind of scary to think about. Maybe it has been more than five years, I don't even remember. But um, yeah, this like whole, I'm glad that, that, that I have the opportunity to be in a space like this and be able to to I, like it sucks that I wasn't able to experience a space like this as an undergrad so I'm hoping that uh that by having this like just being able to pay it forward in some way is like someone can learn from the things that I've experienced in my two years as a graduate student and you know feel free to ask any questions and yeah and also like Carlos said thank you all for being here on a Saturday Cool. Carlos, I think you're a co-host, so you can share your screen to share the PowerPoint. If not, I think one of us might have to become the host. Yeah, I wasn't prepared to share the PowerPoint. Um, can one of y'all do it? Bree, if you're not down, um, if I can be made the co-host, because Bree, you're co-host as well. I got it. I okay. Got it, I got it ready to go. I got it. I got it now. I got it now. Sorry about that, y'all. 
hope y'all don't see all my business. Lord have mercy. Not the double click. Thank you, Bree. Okay. I'm like, you see the quarter of slavery in East Africa, still important. Please ignore the documents. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think Carlos, you could introduce this slide because I, I, you know, you came up with thematics of the black and red, um, but I'll share the screen and the PowerPoint. Let's see. Cool. Well, yeah. So, so we um, we came up with these slides. We came up with this PowerPoint. Um, you know, thinking about what what I don't what I don't presented to us, um, and in terms of of surviving academia in terms of um, resistance uh, within, you know, within the university. Um, these are these are the, the slides that we're gonna show you. Um, this, this is a dope ass image that was sent to us. Um, we we, we uh, over, over the, the last summer we worked on um, a disorientation guide, but the abolished the UC edition. Um, and someone has sent us this dope ass image of the UC emblem shattered um and you know frankly something that i that i love to see um so yeah so so this is our take on how we survive um uh, within that ivory tower how we um resist um within the university um yeah thanks for liking that uh jasmine appreciate it yeah all right, y'all. So <clears throat> this is not a shock to anybody here in this space, I hope. Um, yeah, we can make the slides available if everyone, you know, is okay with it. I'm fine with it. Um, I, I kind of threw this slide together just because in archaeology, I'm studying obviously settler colonialism, but um, it, it's just, it's crazy to me. Like I can't, I was at Berkeley in my undergrad, you know, and then now I'm here at Santa Cruz and I'm stuck in this UC system, just seeing the same colonizers thing happening, you know, just year after year. Um, and so, so part of why I wanted to show this imagery is one, so that we obviously don't forget that this is settler colonialism and that wasn't just an event. This is a process that continues. This is a process that is here to stay and that's why we're fighting it, right? Um, but even within these academic spaces, this is why we have such a hard time um, because we don't fit in because this is, an institution that is made to keep us down. You know, they don't they don't want us to actually get ahead. Um, so, for example, you know, these spaces like they look beautiful and all that, but I, I personally always felt really intimidated, um, just at the university level in general, but especially in the UCs. Then I come here to Santa Cruz as a PhD student, and they're like, "There's still mission bells on campus," you know, <laughs> like, and uh, and they just took this one down last year. But I did tie in this quote here that I found in an article um, about the bell being taken down. And it says, these bells are deeply painful symbols that celebrate the destruction, domination, and erasure of our people, um, said Valentin Lopez, chair of the Amamutsin tribal band. They are, they are constant reminders that our people and our history continue to be disregarded to this day. Um, and again, right, we're not surprised by this, but the fact that this just kind of is a norm, you know, these places are on stolen land, these universities are literally displacing uh, the people that whose, whose land this is, and at the same time, putting us all into debt because of cost of living, at the same time, um, not allowing the students that who are people, the descendants of this land, right, they're really the least accessible to even come and, and, and get an education. Um, so it just, yeah, it just, I think it's important to always have that as the background of like why we're fighting these um, bigger systemic issues because this is, like I said, an ongoing process. It wasn't just an event. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Brie. Uh, I, I, I could I could I could touch on this. Um, so <clears throat> us being from 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 this from this university, a lot of us uh, participated. Well, all of us participated um, in the in the strike of last year, the Cola strike. Um, but but one thing that really gets I think I think gets uh, murked out 
is that while, although graduate students um, were asking for, you know, for a higher, higher wages, the cost of living in order for them to, to, to live where they work, um, us, us here within the space, um, Bree, Jasmine, Brenda, myself, and other folks, Mariah, we see you. Um, we, we were able to organize and get undergrads involved. We were able to get um, just a lot of different people from the community that also need a living wage to kind of expand the conversation that is not just about grad students, that a lot of us are, are you know, all of us are, are just pretty much in this fucking, in this fucked up situation where we can't afford to live um, in a place where we go to school and in places that we work. Um, so rent burden, food insecurities um, was, was, it's, was an ongoing issue, still is an ongoing issue. Um, and yeah, so grad students, service workers, adjunct faculty members were all kind of part of our strike. I think, I, I think at the, lar the larger picture, people just think about grad students asking for more money. Uh, but for us on the ground over here, it was, it was a lot more than that. And within the next slides, we're gonna show you uh, what we did in order to um, take care of ourselves in terms of us being, um, yeah, rent burden and food insecure. So um, when the folks of us that are here on this call, um, well, Carlos has been participating in the sort of COLA efforts, the cost of living adjustment efforts since um, they sort of launched their campaign whenever, like in November or October or whenever the UC start. Um, but I coming like into a place where I witnessed my neighborhood be gentrified by white college students um, over the last five to six years I was really uncomfortable with joining a campaign that was basically promoting us to be better gentrifiers. So I really wanted to think critically about how we could like be involved with something like this because obviously I also want more money from the university. Pay us, not your white students. So um, we came together <clears throat> like very casually and informally, but based in this idea that we can do more to demonstrate our commitments to our personal ethics in the university than just this cost of living call. And so we came up with um, a seven day, in, the, in, the, in December of 2019, we came up with a seven day uh, campaign series of actions and began with um, this idea that this is not a hunger strike. We weren't gonna perform not eating for anyone. We were just gonna expose what conditions the students were living under every day. And um, in doing so, we really got to see as folks have kind of been saying, what are, how do these dynamics of settler colonialism, food insecurity hit home on the student um, on the day to day? And right, so we have, if you can look to the right side, we have a whiteboard that says hashtag not eating as usual. This is our 12, cola for all. And this was our first day and someone had only eaten a Lunchable, a pack of oral rehydration salts, one lemon cookie and a Red Bull. And that's how they were sustaining themselves for the day. Um, and so we really started to think about what can we do to not only expose how folks are hungry, but really come together to make sure people's needs are met because we already understood the university didn't couldn't meet our needs, right? Our arrival there to the university in itself, uh, for us seemed to demonstrate that it wasn't prepared to handle these coalition, the coalitions of black, indigenous and native students that were coming together to like talk about cost of living in a different way. Um, yeah. Does anyone want to talk about this image? I can talk about it, but if somebody else wants. I will. So, um... One thing that is important to remember when you're involved in an institution like a school is that you, you're not allowed to really talk about the things that are going wrong and that talking about it and like pointing it out is makes you the problem. And um, so, you know, like screaming about it makes you really the problem. And so we had all these, we spent, uh, I guess it was the beginning of winter quarter. That makes sense logistically, right? The first day of winter quarter, dropping these banners all through campus and these images, uh, the cops off campus. Um, and uh, the, the regents are, were like put in, they were all put in places where you had to notice them if you're coming to campus. First days of quarter, everybody's going to campus. You gotta get your get all your stuff together. 
So we've had them, like this is our big parking garage and the, and the other one is like we're across from our bookstore. And so these are noticeable places that people ha had to be confronted with these, with the ideas of the like outlandish proliferation of policing on our campus and our city and like spiraling out to this whole piece of land that we're on. And um, also the, there's the, the hidden or kind of semi-hidden fact that all of, all of this that we're doing, um, like as UC students is all in service of the regents and uh, the, we don't know who, like we don't know anything about them. They have like closed meetings. They have all of these interests that are mostly in real estate, but uh, not not in education or in any anything that has anything to do with what we're actually doing. And there are, like there's currently a region who is involved in a never ending like sexual assault case like they're just they they it is truly like unchecked power and all of our decisions that are made like all of our campuses are are being pushed right now to expand and increase um online education and increase undergrad education and like the, the money makers like the mas and mfas and all of that is coming from directives from the regents and they are people who were not allowed to speak to um, and were not allowed to even really know about they have like they all of their like website their bios are like a paragraph long it's like they're they're just they're appointed by the governor and it's a very ridiculous and and shady setup and then next slide, please, Carlos. Or Bree, sorry, whoever's doing it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, yeah. And then this slide. So we have all of these, you know, we come in and we get our diversity stipends and stuff like that. And um, so every UC campus has these these Eugene Coder Robles fellowships, but what I found out just very recently is that we're all getting paid different amounts for for being diverse, and they had a big like during their strikes, the our campus, out of the kindness of their hearts, told a bunch of people who were on. Coda Robles fellowships that they would increase their fellowship amount and then gave them a dollar amount. And through talking to each other, that dollar amount is just the same amount of money that I was being paid as a new as an incoming student. So it's just like every keeping us apart and keeping us not talking to each other is is helpful to the university in so many ways, especially to their pockets. So it's very important to always be talking about what, um, especially because we like probably have like, you're gonna be in classes and you're gonna be in, in community with people who have been trained to navigate these systems since they were like in middle school. And that's not all of us. And being able to ask those questions of your peers, um, if you, if you can is also very helpful just to be like how much is your fellowship what is being taken out of your check every month and those and make sure that we're all on the same page because we don't need to be getting further nickel and dimed by this by this university and um i also want to like personally when i came here like this the amount of money that I was making on the fellowship and probably still as a TA is like more money that I've made at a single job ever. But that doesn't, 
but didn't take into the account that like I now live in in like a stupid expensive city and there's no reason for it to be this this way and like there's the housing is mostly uh that just unlivable like there there was last year there was supposed to be like this huge push to get all of these places that were not fit for humans to live in uh inspected but then the virus the virus happened so we the city didn't do it so it just means that people are just still living in places that are not fit for people to live in and paying like twelve hundred dollars a month to, to do so so it's it's that's another thing to look into when you get a funding package is what is the real cost of living and how much does that and how much like will how much will not ever come to you because of taxes and things like that. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Jasmine, thank you. Um, just, you know, you know, not to always be like, I'm a student parent, but I'm a student parent. <laughs> and and really like I, I did, I did, it was a shock when, you know, you come to these uh, to these meetings where they're like, you, you really should come to this PhD program. And they were like, you have a great funding package because of Coda Robles. And then, you know, I get here and then I'm like, well, shit, they don't care that I have a kid. They don't, they don't care that the cost of living is, is insane here. Um, and so it's the, those packages are, are lies. You know, they, you, they're not gonna get you through, you will end up in debt. Um, and, and the reason here, you know, to, to put in the picture here is, Hell is supporting sex work. It's not even about the fact that it's sex work. It's the fact that, um, you know, we have to get all these extra jobs, right? Like what the bottom of that picture says um, from her sign here is, I worked as a stripper to survive my fourth year of grad school on top of TAing and running a new program at the Women's Center. And then <laughs> she was a 2018 UCSC Chancellor's Diversity Award recipient. I mean, it's, you know, and that's the reality of it. We're all just spreading ourselves thin or becoming, um, getting into debt. And as, as Jasmine said, there's no transparency in any of this. If we don't talk to each other, we don't know that we're getting screwed by, by the university because they're over here telling us what we want to hear, right? Go ahead, Bree. Um, and, and thank you all for saying this because it's all of these like nexus of things that really came together while the screen's loading. I'm going to talk about our transition that really made us kind of sit there and realize we didn't just want people to talk about their suffering. And it was another activist in our community who was like, we don't need to just talk about how hungry we are. We don't just need to um, talk about how much sleep we don't have. We need to like take that space back. So part of the, the workings that we did to thrive um, in, involved like the spiritual work, um, this to create the, the basis of our work, right? So we built ofrendas, we built altars, we prayed on the altar, on the in front of the altar, we prayed on picket lines. Different folks brought their spiritual practice, folks brought different things to smudge and burn. And all of these things came together for us to really set the tone for the type of work you can do even within the Eifert Hour, right? Like we can still show our ethical commitments. And I really am so honored that the first, um, like our three, introductory like speakers fr frame this their work like this because these are the same questions we were asking uh, the students on campus because we didn't know them right like as much as we were their students I was the first year you know as much as folks might have been their um, teachers we didn't know necessarily all the things that they thought about practices love healing and freedom and these are the types of work that folks came and participated in um, together to create again and again and again, right? So we never had to go without these types of spaces as well. So you can get this work in, in the middle of an activist space and also in the middle of a university space, like people will help you take back your spiritual workings. And as somebody from the US South, like this is also really important because like I'm a person in diaspora. So being able to build altars in community was a really beautiful experience for me as well. And so, yeah, and in this, and part of this effort, and other folks can speak to this because I know we have a couple of pictures about this coming up, but 
um, a lot of folks might have heard about the dining hall actions, and if you haven't, the liberation of the dining halls. This was part of the series of direct actions that we took over the course of um, the, the, the grip holding and also the full picket line. Um, and anybody who wants to speak to this can from our homies, um, because we began that first day with ceremony, right? We had invited folks from Amamutsin to come in and do this action with us, right? To break bread with us. And so really rooted in that idea of honoring where we were fundamentally on campus trying to take food and then also feeding our people like the Black Panthers, like we honoring the folks that we've seen do it first. So not trying to be original, just trying to play at what everyone has already laid out before us. So if anybody else wants to speak to this or if I can move on to a new slide, let me know. Um, that's my son. <laughs> so um, anybody else can speak to this too from our group, but I just personally want to say, you know, we're talking about how we're surviving here. Um, and I, uh, sorry, there's an airplane out the, outside. I, I literally got to the point where I could not feed my child. Um, and the UC did not give any, any fucks about that. Um, you know, you, you try to, you, they tell you like, here's all these resources, but even that in itself, it's extra labor. How am I supposed to raise my child by myself, get my PhD, go TA, and then hit up three different pantries in the same week because I'm having to pull from different resources just to feed my kid. So these actions to me personally like meant so much because that's what my son remembers from the strikes. He's like, remember when we got to go to the dining hall and just, you know, it's buffet style. So just fill up our plates and that that's community right that's that's love right there um that's survival so if anybody else wants to yeah I'll, I'll i'll jump in real quick yeah so definitely we you know we paid homage to the black panther party um for paving the way in terms of us you know taking um taking the resources that we had available and being being able to feed one another being community with one another and at the same time not forgetting about the service workers that at the time were without a contract so we were you know, constantly, you know, giving them shout outs, trying to let them know that, you know, we're behind them, you know, all these service workers are, are majority, you know, um, brown people, poor brown people from the area, not from the area, they, they live, you know, 50 miles away from Watsonville, from Salinas, you know, they, they travel from far and wide to come to go to the university so they could work. Um, so yeah, um, it was, you know, it was a great series of events. That's how, kind of we, how that's how we started uh, spreading the work out that um, we were going on strike, you know, by by being able to open up dining halls and be able to feed, you know, feed people. And that's why we, you know, we think there is a war on a substance that the UC partakes in. Um, because of all that, you know, um, we got, you know, we got targeted by the admin by administrators. Uh, so by the time that we um, started our, our our full picket um, in the early month, the early days of February, uh, it was no surprise that the UC engaged in counterinsurgency. Um, so they could essentially, you know, put us down um, and, you know, and, and shut our movement down because at this time we were, you know, pick, picking up a lot of momentum, you know, folks were, were knowing that, that there was, there was folks out there um, that weren't just worried about getting, getting a paycheck or getting a little bit more money on their paycheck. And we were about feeding one another. We were about caring for one another. We were about being there for one another. Um, and we, you know, we took risks to make that shit happen. Um, so, so what you see here. Um, the UC and counterinsurgency. Um, you see um, sheriffs. You see um, you see UCPDs from all over the states. Um, so you know this 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 is the shit that they that they engaged in in order to uh, suppress us to put us down. Um, Multi-level agencies cooperating one with one another in order to uh, tell a bunch of students that you know they shouldn't be out there that they should be you know good good students and teachers following the rules. But we said, fuck all that. And a very literal representation of the fuck all that um, <laughs> we have right here from the City on Hill Press. And I'll just, these next two images are dealing with um, police contact too. So that just so folks know. With, with this one, uh, can you go back? Yeah, 
I just, I wanted to point out um, again, these, these things have been happening for years at the UC campuses, okay? Like the, this picture from 2017 was my last day at UC Berkeley and I had to jump actual barricades to go to my class to take my final. Um, and hella students were triggered. So it's, you know, this policing, policing on campus has been going on for years. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw um, And on the left side, you'll see the cops off campus with the big old piggy in the middle. Um, and this is, was part of one of the efforts that the undocumented students used to reclaim space, um, undocumented collective used to reclaim space um, at their academic resource center. So it wasn't for us thriving in a community like Santa Cruz was actively fighting against all the tactics of isolation, um, all the tactics of dividing um, like us physically to socially and really pushing back and so really constantly putting these coalitions to the forefront and showing up, you know, the same level of direct action intensity for undocumented collective as we as we would for a dining hall action as we would for um, the, the the full picket line and and these ways I feel like showed us how we thrive rather than just survive um, because these are the bonds that sustained us and yeah. This is, yeah, just showing again in images, um, same thing that Bree was just saying, right? Uh, we, you know, we, we said in the beginning, surviving the ivory tower, right, With from within, uh, we created the child care, we fed each other. The UC did not do that. It was us saying, we're gonna be ungovernable, we're gonna do this, you know, and take care of each other. And and that's that's how we've survived, right? Yeah, and I want to say like about the produce, it became a point where folks didn't need to like ask permission to be a part of Carlos talking um, about it too, right? Like I remember the first day there was an action in the quarry and folks just showed up with produce saying they were cola for all. I had never heard of them and it didn't matter, right? Because that was the type of community we were trying to build up. You could show up with like what you had to share uh, to build. Uh, Los? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say that a lot of this, a lot of our our, our work, you know, is it's uh, rooted rooted in, in community. Like we have a political commitment besides our our school work, right? Where our school, I feel like a lot of our school work is very very. Um, it's just for ourselves and our advisor. Um, but I think I think for me, I learned a lot in these weeks, these months, working with my comrades than in any any seminar, than any webinar than any um, uh, little talks that they host. I don't even know what the fuck the talks are called. I don't even go to them. But when I do, I don't learn shit. Um, it was the actions, you know, the direct actions where we able to pretty much um, engage in hands-on learning, engage in what, you know, what community to me is all about. Um, and, you know, by being, being able to feed people, by being able to be there for one another, that, as you see that image of, of folks stepping up and say, you know what, those who have kids, I can take care of them for X amount of hours, then other people kind of pick up a shift. I mean, to me, that's that's all that's what it was all about. Does it show? Yeah. Okay. And this is sort of our last slide, but thinking about um what it means to continue to thrive and what visions we have for the future, right? There was a brief moment where the entirety of campus was shut down, right? And I think when we talk about land back and abolition, like you can literally shut down your campus, right? It'll take a lot of planning. It'll, it'll take you waking up at four o'clock in the morning and doing other things, but you can literally shut it down. And, and, and honestly, thinking about how we can make these, you know, research and colonial extractive universities places of care and practice is by shutting them down and doing exactly um, what folks have been doing on this call by listening and engaging and also by um, feeding each other. Um, anybody else want to say anything? But yeah, um, closing the campus was one of those times where we got a glimpse that like it's possible to shut it down again in 2020 in this decade in this time frame.
Jasmine, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you want to close us out? <laughs> you can just say no if you don't want to. <laughs> no, I can't. Yeah, I'll say something. Um, that that uh, whatever school you go to is not going to be a place that's going to give you any of those things that we talked about what, that you need to thrive and you're going to have to build them and you're going to have to find the people who are already building them and and work with them and there's a lot um of talk about like you know finding your 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 people and your and that is truly the most important thing to maintain relationships with the, the community that you are in now and to also build new relations with with the community that you're going to enter Cool, cool, cool. Well, thank you, um, everyone. Much love, uh, much appreciation. Um, just checking the time, it's five o'clock. Um, we intended to finish by this time, but I think, I don't know if folks are still open to maybe a few more minutes to uh, stick around for some questions, if folks have any. Um, I know I do, and I, I can just, I guess, get it started with that. Um, and yeah, it, it's very just, you know, inspiring to just hear you all. And like, I, you know, seeing these images, I just, I preached myself there, which I was and try to bring it back to our campuses, you know, every, every campus. And I think something that was felt across was certain dynamics, right? With like white students, right? Having them, I like how you, uh, was I think Bree said what, like being better gentrifiers, so that's what you're struggling for, you know? So it's like, yeah, it's like, they just, you know, are they the victims now, <laughs> you know? So I just felt like, you know, there's always that dynamic, um, but, you know, and then also with like, um, you know, the union as well, who had like this uh, no strike clause and shit, you know, and who are, you know, together with management, you know? So um, I guess how, you know, were y'all able to kind of, um, you know, manage that, deal with that, um, those dynamics with still keeping, you know, uh, this energy going and how maybe has, you know, this pandemic, right? You know, we've all been out of school, you know, virtual reality now, um, but going in, going back into school, right? And um, I think with Trump, it was just an outright fascism, right? And I was like, it's a liberal face to fascism, you know? Or even how like the UC, like Janet Napolitano, yeah, we're all like, you know, fuck Janet Napolitano, you know, the former head of, you know, um, Homeland Security, right? But then, then the UC, you know, um, for, uh, hire a, a black president, you know? So like how, you know, uh, despite whoever is in these positions of power, right? Like how are these structures, you know, like how do we, you know, really um, get that continue um, with your energy, your movement that you've had over the years? Um, again, very inspirational, but you know, how can we continue that going into uh, the, the years to come, so. Brie, you want to take that? I was looking at you. I was like, Los, go ahead. Um, I think ultimately, I know, how do I say this? Like Jen Napolitano is in charge of Zoom, right? So we did all of that protesting and not everybody's on Zoom. And I remember I got in trouble. My professor thought I was disrespectful because I was like, I'm just not going to be on Zoom this week. I'm not going to do it. There's nothing you can do. You know, I have family members that are going to work every day i'm inside because i've made it inside of this fucking ivory tower and i'm trying to make sure that like i have some ethical commitments so i couldn't do zoom and i feel like there's ways that uh we really want to um use technology to like to stop participating in it right like you know like i i really think there's a fear that um the technology is a, a more special place but there for me i think the non-participation in technology couldn't do a Zoom protest. <laughs> um, folks logged off. I mean, I remember at the time NYU was going on strike. Um, and so they they had logged off as well. They refused to teach digital classes. Folks didn't hold sections, right? So there's all ways of non-participation that we can still hold digitally going forward. And also protesting in person is still safer than going to any restaurant to eat. So it is always still safer to gather in person to protest the state than it is to, to take care and 
of a capitalistic urge. Um, so going forward, like remembering that cases didn't spike because we were protesting for black life. Um, cases spiked because of white supremacy, you know, like and white supremacist outrage. They didn't spike because of us doing our work. And so I think going forward is to remember that our work isn't harmful and that it's like actively what sustains us through these pandemics is what fights pandemics from spreading um, because folks can eat and and get access to healthy meals and things like that by community support and mutual aid. Oh yeah, anyone else? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think coming together. Um, if if um, I mean that's that's how a lot of us have survived. You know, this pandemic through mutual aid, through our comrades, through our friends, looking out for one. You know, looking out for each other, um, looking out for us. Um, so I, I think heading in towards towards the fall, if they open up the schools, um, I think a lot of us here are gonna still kicking ass. We're still gonna be fucking getting together, mobilizing, organizing. And still, you know, giving these fucking admin, these administrators, these bosses, fucking hell. Uh, I think we have a commitment towards one another. We have a political commitment to keep doing what we're doing. Um, like I said, I am in, on academic probation. I am on behavioral probation. And it's because of the shit that we've engaged in. Um, even though I'm kind of caught up with my, my cohort, um, there's still all these um, policies and norms and regulations within departments, they gotta be within normative time and all that bullshit. Um, so yeah, um, we find, you know, well, they find ways to pretty much get rid of us. You know, they find ways to, to repress us for our political work, for our ideas. Um, and we're just gonna keep pushing back, you know, um, as long as uh, these institutions are in place, there's always gonna be people like us throwing fucking bricks, you know, doing what we gotta do to fucking make sure that, you know, they crumble one day, we'll just be doing our part. Cool. I don't know if folks um, from the other campuses, uh, um, if y'all, if, how do y'all see, you know, sustaining a uh, future going in uh, to this, this year, what to expect and, or, you know, how do we sustain ourselves, maintain ourselves in a, with the equilibrium? I don't know if uh, Diana or Nadia or Ella, if y'all have any um, thoughts on that. I would just say quickly, like um, one of the things that I think is most important that um, Bree, Brenda, Jasmine, Carlos, you all presented was that it's important to share information. And that came up in the brainstorm that we did so that we're not like, it's so easy to be divided just because you don't know <laughs> what your fellow student is going through or you don't know that your fellow student has been disenfranchised. Um, it's easy to sort of like also be in your bubble. Like these programs also create that where you can just kind of like be in your little box and not have to worry about anybody else. But like, how can we, when we know all this is going on? So I think that's very important for us to continue to be in, in dialogue and in community. Um, so to me, I really appreciate you all lifting that because I think that's so important and maybe the most important to, to have that care for each other. The thing that I would add to that and like I appreciate the space and like the way y'all have like laid it out for us too. at UCI, you know, Naya and I were like, you know, talking about y'all all the time and the work that y'all were doing and you know, even the shit that went down there with the white folks that pushed us out and like pushed the narrative that we were really trying to like disrupt there. We got a sense of it. So I, you know, shout out to y'all for holding it down in the face of all that fucked up shit, you know. Um, and I think for me, like what has held me down in the like participating in a grad program is always being in community with folks. Like even the way that I approach my work, it's about like talking to folks in the community. 
And I think that's the only way that I can continue disrupting the space that I participate in and also extract from it, right? Like Savannah Shangay, you know, said that on Twitter. She said, your role as a graduate student is to extract resources, right? So I'm gonna extract as much as I can in the most ethical way, but also the university is not the end all be all for a lot of us, right? Like we're just gonna make other spaces where we're actually learning and where I'm actually still pushing, you know, boundaries for spaces for the younger generations, right? just the way other folks have paved the way for us. Dope, dope, dope. Cool. We have a question from the chat earlier in the chat. And it says, uh, as much as I want a PhD, I feel like I don't have the desire for this at this time and may never. How do I navigate becoming a respected expert at my craft without having the degree backing so I can blow it up and do my do my thing. If someone doesn't mind taking that question. I love that question because um, you definitely don't need the letters or the piece of paper to do it. And somebody I think had said like it's it it's um it's a good to have if you want to be in these institutions and work it from the inside. Um, that was one of the reasons why I did it because even though I had a terminal degree, a terminal master's, some of the things that I wanted to do within the academy, I couldn't do it without a PhD. So, and I also did it selfishly for myself because there are things that I wanted to learn. I didn't do it so much for just the credential, but I tell people like the, being able to take classes, to be in these kinds of conversations, to be with like folks who are, thinking about critical issues is as much to me the reward as the end result. So to me, like that is also a luxury to be able to think with people in a critical way. And I've tried to have the mindset that that is my priority and not, you know, going back to what um, Nalia said, like you tend to your own learning, you set your own priorities of what you want to learn. So if you can frame it like that, it makes it, it makes it so that you are at the center rather than the university being at the center and dictating what it is that you're doing. And you should always be at the center. It's your learning, it's your program, it's your dissertation at the end. But that's not for everybody and you don't need it to do some of the things. Like there are some people who are putting out great critical work who don't have it and are adding a lot to, you know, the, the conversations that we're having. So if you want to build yourself up as an expert, it's just about consistency. The same way what you're doing in here is the same thing that you could be doing outside, um, just building up producing stuff, putting it out in the world for people to, to, to see and consume and walk with you in your critique. That's just all it is. Yeah, I wanna build on that um, because really like, well, so as an academic, as a researcher, right? Um, like the goal is to publish. And like, we get taught that the only way to publish to be like respected, is to like get into these like top tier journals but like actually like who are you being respected by when you do that like not the people that you care about because like they're not gonna fucking read that shit like that they're just not right so it's like who is the, who is your priority in getting like the information that you're also like helping to build and construct right and self-publishing and creating your own spaces um, and that's like one of the things that I really like about the disorientation guide, right? Because it was like a reclamation of experiences and it was in a way, it was done in a way that was like, fuck all of your shit. Like, we're just gonna do our own thing. Like here, and here's what we wanna say and how we're gonna frame our, what, we're, what we wanna say. I'm gonna add to that Nalia um, and Ella, um, because I just, I think that this also goes along with going forward um like i have a huge problem with like jstor and just accessibility because it should be that we can just go out and be scholars right but then there's all these fucking gatekeeping things and in archaeology i've seen the ugly side of that which is i'm over here in belize 
I'm, you know, I identify as Mexican, but I was born here, right? I have a hell of a privilege. And I'm over here in Belize, literally taking artifacts out of the ground, working under a white woman. And I'm like, what's gonna happen with all this research? You know, it's gonna get published, right? And then these folks here in Placencia Peninsula in the south of Belize aren't gonna see it. So then what's the point? You're not making a difference. You're literally just colonizing more. So I just think that along with that, we have to like make that push going forward to, to make this knowledge really accessible to everybody, um, but especially to, to those people who it will benefit. And then the academic loves to study the expert. Like we, sometimes we forget that we got to go ask other people to do our work. So ultimately you might end up working closely with someone who has a PhD and needing your expertise without it. So we, like, I have to go talk to community to do some of the work. So you can be that community expert and you really might be fundamental to the work of four or five scholars of color later down the line or scholars working on indigenous work. I don't know what you're doing, but you know, that role, like seeing you cite it will be like, oh, I can have it multiple ways. So like you're, the way you're going about it too can, can, can be totally fine because we got to consult. Yeah, and I want to add that, that the hesitation that you're feeling and thinking, or just say, I, I don't want to get my PhD is the sign that you need to not get your PhD and to not try to get your PhD. And um, because there is more than likely you, even if you do somehow suffer through it and finish and get your PhD, you'll come out on the other side and you still won't feel like the expert because you'll have you'll become have become an expert in getting a PhD and not in doing whatever the thing is that you wanted to do. Um, yeah, I know, I know we're way over time, but I'll just, I'll just be very brief. Um, <clears throat> to me, a PhD ain't shit. Um, I'm on the brink of jumping out of the program. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm gonna go work with the community, go do something that I think is fulfilling, that I feel like should feed my soul as opposed to me writing shit that only my advisor and myself are gonna fucking read and talk about over and over and over and over and over again, draft after draft. Um, not to say that um, these degrees um, don't mean anything because as society, you know, we, we've come to value uh, those three little letters. Uh, but for me and for, for, for my integrity, um, I'm gonna say, fuck the PhD. I'm gonna walk away. Um, yeah, the system, system is shit. Uh, I think it's a fucking trap. Um, a lot of us can't survive off these fucking wages and fuck it all. So I think that's a good way to end off. <laughs> uh, appreciate it, um, everyone. And yeah, if, if you all enjoyed this, uh, we're gonna have another uh, session uh, coming up but with other folks that, you know, uh, community artists that are doing their thing that don't need these titles you know, um, and just trying to find uh, institutional support, you know, for those who are not given these spaces, you know, uh, being able to uh, uh, redistribute those resources, you know, they're definitely exporting us, so we got to export them, you know, so um, yeah, look out for that, and um, anything y'all need, you know, we're just, uh, y'all can email the, um, the group that sent out the, the, the link, and